test. Hey, how's this sound? You all hear that? All right. Good to go. Is this one on? Oh, yeah, okay. All right. Hello, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Chelsea Taylor Fluck, and I am pleased to be facilitating this awesome session here today at an awesome conference. Um, I wanted to welcome everyone and thank you so much for attending. Uh, and also to thank our hosts and all the organizers and volunteers at Parkland. Give them a hand. Um, I also wanted to start off and acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 tr uh, territory of the Papas Chase Cree, um, who were supposed to have a reserve actually on the south side of town, but some guy, you know, worked to... I mean, a lot of guys, but one in particular worked to make sure that they didn't have that, and now we have a part of town named after him on the north side. Ugh. Um, so they are currently fighting to have their treaty rights recognized by the federal government and just wanted to do a shout out to support the Papa's Chase. That leads us into our talk. Um, so we are here joined by Clayton Thomas Mueller uh, to discuss the rise of a native rights-based strategic framework, um, Canada's last best effort to save the commons. We're honored and pleased to have Clayton Thomas Mueller join us at the Parkland Conference. Clayton is a campaigner with Idle No More and co-director of the Indigenous Tar Sands Campaign at the Polaris Institute. He's also a member of the Matthias Colum Cree, also known as Pugatawagan in Northern Manitoba, Canada. He is an organizer, a facilitator, public speaker, uh, writer on e environmental and economic justice. Uh, for the last 11 years, he has campaigned across Canada Alaska, the lower 48 states, organizing in hundreds of First Nations, Alaska Native and Native American communities in support of grassroots Indigenous peoples to defend against the encroachment of the fossil fuel industry. This has included a special focus on the sprawling infrastructure of pipelines, refineries and extraction associated with the Canadian tar sands. He is here with us today to discuss one area that the Harper government uh, has not been able to stack the cards in, which is the Canadian courts. Clayton and many others believe that a native rights-based tactical and strategic framework supported by labor, NGOs, students, and other social movements scaled up to the proportion of the 1960s U.S. civil rights movement is not only going to dethrone Harper, but it'll also be our last be best effort to save our resources from Canada's extractive industries and the banks that finance them. So without further ado, please to introduce my friend, badass organizer, Clayton Thomas Mueller. Wow, I, um, I was giggling to my colleague uh, and dear friend Chelsea, who just did that gracious introduction. I said, you know, I, I, for some reason, I don't know why I had it in my head, I thought that I, I was going to be doing one of four breakouts and that I would have, you know, a smaller group. And uh, she said, no, you're in that big room. And I was like, oh boy, okay, all right, so here we are. <laughs> um, I am very, very humbled to be invited to be a part of the Parkland Institute Conference. I've heard over the years, while I haven't attended, um, that this gathering is one of the premier gatherings in this country that they call Canada for, you know, thinkers and st strategists and organizers and concerned community members to come together and really, you know, put our minds together and, you know, to quote Sitting Bull, uh, to put our minds and hearts together and to see what kind of world we can create for our children. And uh, so I, I want to acknowledge the organizers from the Parkland Institute for bringing all of you together today uh, in a good way. And I also too, yeah, give them a round of applause. <clears throat> and I really want to also uh, follow the good protocol demonstrated by my, my dear friend Chelsea, and acknowledge as a guest in this territory um, the, the, the Cree people of this area. Of course, I'm Cree as well, and also <laughs> from Treaty 6. Pugatawagan First Nation is the furthest eastern Treaty 6 First Nation, uh, located at the 56th parallel on the border of Saskatchewan in Manitoba on the Churchill River, uh, or as we call it, the Misinepe. And uh, it's a fishing community. 
In our language, Pagadawagan is the literal act of putting out the net to catch fish. And my father and all my brothers and uncles are all fishermen and, you know, that's, that's how they live. And they hunt moose and beaver and goose and muskrat and all kinds of other yummy little critters. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Buju, Zongi Bini Sienene Tishnakas Gnu Totem. Also, keeping in protocol, I wanted to open with the song, if that would be okay with all of you. <clears throat> oh, easy there. Let me sing first. <laughs> I don't want to disappoint you. I don't know. You might want to turn my mic off, uh, our audio person. Where'd she go? Oh. Just, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to deaf everybody. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, let's see here, little goodies. Uh, oh, ah. sorry. <clears throat> anyway, so I was invited here to talk about the work, I guess, that, that myself and so many others um, in the circles that I travel in have been a part of and um, critical work, important work, you know, work aimed at supporting those communities most vulnerable to the current economic paradigm and the symptoms of the economic paradigm <clears throat> that we currently live under. Symptoms like the tar sands and other forms of extreme energy, symptoms like climate change, and poverty, um, and it's, it's good work. Uh, many people in the movement refer to it as the good fight. And we find ourselves right now here in this country that they call Canada in a precarious situation where the polarity between the rich and the poor, between the haves and the have-nots is growing every single day, where racism has become so acceptable and rampant that it's just part of the daily norm and we're bombarded with it in mainstream media. It's an interesting time to be living in, full of a lot of apathy and indifference. And for me, you know, as challenging as it is, um, I'm 36 years old and I've entered into a time in my life where I have two beautiful sons, Felix and Jackson, seven and five years old, I have a wonderful wife, and we're raising our kids in a good way, as best as we can. 
And I get a lot of hope out of that. And I just wanted to kind of open up with that statement, you know, while I get into this presentation about the native rights-based strategic framework and why a lot of people, communities, social movement groups um, have gravitated towards this strategic and tactical framework as, you know, as Pam, Dr. Pam Palmater has referred to it as the last best effort to protect Canada's water, earth, and air from extractive industries. <clears throat> After a long period of resistance to colonialism and decades of devastation during this last century, indigenous communities in this country that they call Canada have reached a turning point. This is the culmination of specific struggles ranging from the white paper. How many of you remember that? Yeah? I see some of you silver foxes in the room. Yeah. <laughs> ranging from the white paper struggle and resistance to development and environmental racism in places like Grassy Narrows in Ontario, the Mackenzie Valley pipeline struggle in the Northwest Territories, James Bay, the struggle against mega hydroelectric development in the 70s, and through the legal and constitutional struggles of the 1980s and 1990s, some of you might remember the Constitution Express, one of the most impactful actions taken by indigenous peoples to advocate our priority indigenous and treaty rights in this country that resulted in them becoming enshrined in the Canadian Constitution section 23. <clears throat> but there's also been a range of local struggles throughout the 90s and the 2000s that we have also been touched by. Indigenous communities in Canada have developed a complex ideological and legal framework for engaging with and resisting this colonial state. Today across Canada, an unprecedented number of our communities have risen up against colonialism and the ecological devastation of our traditional lands. Here in Alberta, we have seen dozens of First Nations rise up from the blood reserve who are facing two-thirds of their land base being leased out to fracking companies where the women of the blood reservation faced arrest and the courts for standing up to protect the sacredness of their lands. In the north we see the communities in Athabasca, the five Athabasca First Nations inundated with the externalization of environmental and economic and social destruction from the tar sands industry with blazing communities like Athabasca Chippewan First Nations directly confronting big oil corporations like Shell in the courts, out on the land, and out in the streets. And in the Peace River region, you have the Lubicon Cree Nation who has been fighting for decades against the illegal subsidy, uh, or taking of a subsidy, I guess, wealth subsidy, in the form of natural resources being stolen from their land by the Canadian state and the Alberta government and multinational corporations. <laughs> and you have communities like Beaver Lake Cree Nation who have launched a very significant constitutional treaty rights challenge against the federal government of Canada the provincial government of Alberta, and just about every single multinational oil corporation on planet Earth. And in that constitutional challenge, they have cited almost 20,000 violations of their treaty. And it's a very significant thing that has the managers of the world's pension funds, the financial managers of hedge funds, that has banks, all across the planet, particularly in London Square Mile, where all of the money for big oil goes through at the end of every day at 6 p.m., it's got their heads turned. It's got their heads turned. It's got the credit rating agencies looking at the current risk and uncertainty presented by Canada's business scenario, the open for business doors that Harper likes to put out to the world when he 
travels around and describes this country as an emerging energy superpower, when in reality this is a delusion. Canada is nothing more than a resource colony to military superpowers, most, most notably the United States of America. <clears throat> But all these communities in the Cold Lake, Peace River, and Athabasca region, and in southern Alberta fighting against the spread of the destructive fracking industry, and many, many others across Canada, have developed organized political resistance to assert their right to say no to the despoiling of their traditional lands, and to govern themselves in accordance with their own traditions. And across the country, the story is much the same. Whether it's against dam developments in Manitoba or Labrador, or whether it's against the Ring of Fire development in Northern Ontario, where just yesterday, a major cobalt uh, mining company pulled out of their intention to mine in the Ring of Fire, and they cited the fact that they pulled out because they felt that there was too much risk and uncertainty because of the government's failure to mitigate Aboriginal title claims in that region. <clears throat> and when we look at northern Saskatchewan with the defeat by, uh, I can't remember what the name of it, something river, um, Anyway, one of, uh, Eel River, Earl River, anyway. One of the communities, the First Nations communities in San Francisco, or in, uh, in Saskatchewan beat the Nuclear Regulatory Commission of Canada who was trying to put the long-term nuclear waste repository in their land. But there's still a dozen other First Nations on a list, a short list, where Canada's nuclear regulatory industry is continuing to try to store Canada's nuclear waste and uranium mining is spreading across northern Alberta and northern Saskatchewan at an unprecedented rate. They are having a renaissance. And when we look <clears throat> at the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline, you know, this one just gets me. The entire country of Canada said no. There was a referendum. There was lawsuits. And big oil waited a whole frickin' generation to bring that pipeline back. That is how powerful these companies are. That is how patient these companies are. They'll wait 30 years. I mean, how many of you remember the Berger inquiry? Oh yeah, it's like yesterday, right? <laughs> and here we are again. NEB approves the Mackenzie Valley Gas Project. It's like these folks don't get it. <clears throat> Or in British Columbia, again, with the fracking and the coal bed methane. And of course, in El Zapoktog, New Brunswick. <laughs> where the violence of paramilitary forces invading a peaceful blockade of women, children, and men from that community, and not just from the First Nation, but from the Acadian community in New Brunswick, and from the province from all New Brunswickers alike, you know. That violence is fresh in our memories, and we see the legal wrangling and games being played in the lower courts of the province of New Brunswick right now between the government of El Zapoktog and the government of New Brunswick. But the fact of the matter is, is that regardless of how disturbing all this is or how rampant the disproportionate targeting of our First Nations lands are for Canada's extractive industries and raw resource export economic model is. These communities have confidently asserted their inherent and treaty rights, appealing both to traditional understandings of treaty and the intent of their ancestors when they signed those treaties. There is potential now for a broad social movement that issues a challenge to Canadian capitalism, colonialism, and ecological destruction that is as profound as the broadest social movements of the past 40 years. Part of developing this movement is creating spaces for Indigenous communities to share experiences with each other and to strategize together 
outside of government created bureaucracies. And although also important is the creation of a large body of supporters who are able to articulate and understand the issues and intervene in ways that support rather than bar the formation of this broader movement. And so, you know, <clears throat> for the last 12 years, my, my own personal trajectory has been focused primarily on working with First Nations and Alaska Native nations and Native American nations who are fighting against the encroachment of the fossil fuel sector, the energy sector, into their homelands. And, you know, the one thing that I observed throughout all of the, all of the places that I traveled to, whether it was on the north slope of Alaska, fighting to keep big oil out of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, the, what is referred to by the Gwet'chen Nation as the sacred place where life begins, because this is the place where the last remaining intact migrating mass herd of North America goes to have their babies, the porcupine caribou herd. Or if you, you know, are keeping an LNG plant out of the Bay of Fundy in the Passamaquoddy's homeland in Maine, or in Oklahoma, helping communities deal with a legacy of 100 years of oil and gas development in what was supposed to be Indian country, you know, after the Trail of Tears. Or in the tar sands, you know, the world's most destructive development. The one thing that I've seen in all of those places that I've gone is incredible resiliency. And I think that that's been the thing that has so inspired me, has been the ability of our indigenous peoples faced with great, great oppression um, and extremely unfair odds, an extremely unfair playing field continue to stand up, to say no, and to fight uh, for their inherent and their treaty rights. Not, yeah. And all these fights have been burning like, like small fires. And so through my career with the network known as the Indigenous Environmental Network, I was tasked with the responsibility of trying to bring these communities together. I think to share strategies, because in many instances they're fighting the same companies, um, to share strategies about how they are fighting them. To talk about what's working, and I think more importantly about what's not working. And in many instances the stories, the strategies, the tactics were all the same. And so through the 12 years that I organized in those communities, what we see emerging was more sophistication, more ability to communicate and to develop and execute diverse multi-pronged strategies to confront corporate power. Because in North America, you know, the majority of fossil fuel, almost 50% of the attainable fossil fuels is directly underneath indigenous lands, whether, and it's even more for uranium. Um, I think it's like 80 something percent. And that's why these companies are coming into our homelands. And that's why, you know, they spend so much time working in collusion with the federal government to try and counter what I'm here to talk to you about today. Tar Sands campaign. For eight years now, we have seen an incredible campaign, an absolutely incredible global campaign emerge. Quite possibly the most visible campaign ever in the history of environmental campaigns. And for me, what has been so empowering about being one of the organizers of many in the International Indigenous Tar Sands Campaign has been the fact that from the beginning, this campaign has been led by our indigenous women. And we see, <clears throat> 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 
And we see incredible leaders coming out of communities like Beaver Lake Cree Nation in the form of Crystal Lehman, from Athabasca Chippewan First Nation in the form of Ariel Deranger, from Lubicon Cree Nation in the form of Molina Lubicon Massimo, and even in the infrastructure fights against the pipelines, against the shipping lanes, you have against the Enbridge Northern Gateway, you have Chief Jackie Thomas, Jasmine Thomas, Geraldine Lafer, Jackson's, uh, uh, Jasmine's mother. You have women like Frida Hudson from the Unistoten clan who are standing up against Enbridge and about four other pipelines coming through their area in northern BC on the LNG front. You've got Deborah uh, Whiteplume and Faith Spotted Eagle from South Dakota who have said that that northern section of the Keystone XL will not cross the sacred Black Hills not over their dead bodies, not while they're living. You, ha <laughs> you have women like Casey Camp from the Ponca Nation in Oklahoma, the international headquarters of ConocoPhillips, who also say the same thing. And the story is the same in every single community I've worked in. You have strong women that begin the work, usually grandmas, the younger women get involved, they get mentored in, and then when things are ready to rock and roll, the guys come in. <laughs> when, it's all, when the meal's all hot and cooked and everything's all good, and you got all the guys come in anyway. Oh, I hope to turn that around someday, geez. The Tar Sands campaign started off in a really intense way. You know, back in the day, community people in northern Alberta, they started to notice that their food was being affected, their water was being affected. There started to be a lot of sickness in places like Fort Chippewan. Um, and this is like right when the Gulf War in Iraq started happening. And, you know, if you look at the trajectory of U.S. imperialism and U.S. foreign policy and this... This, this foreign policy kind of effort to destabilize OPEC countries, you know, whether it's the Iraq war or whatever, or all these covert wars happening. You know, one of the direct economic impacts of that was it falsely drove up the price of oil. Um, but the, benefit, the benefit of that, of course, is that it made unconventionals or marginal forms of oil, expensive forms of oil, economically viable. And so, if you look at the trajectory of the war in the Persian Gulf, and you look at the trajectory of the development of tar sands here in Alberta, and you look at the trajectory of cancer and autoimmune diseases in native communities downstream from the tar sands, they're right in unison. And so, you know, for us, um, it was absolutely critical that indigenous peoples given that they carried the greatest impact of these externalities of the oil and gas industry, that they lead this campaign, that they are the face of this campaign, that they are speaking for themselves, whether it's in the United States Congress, whether it's in Wall Street, whether it's in the European Union or London Square Mile, or in the Canadian Parliament, that indigenous peoples must be there. And that furthermore, you know, for this campaign to slow down and stop this carbon bomb juggernaut called the tar sands, that it was indigenous peoples and our rights base that would be the legal basis for the strategy to stop it. Because if you look at the history of environmentalism in this country that they call Canada, whether it's James Bay or the Mackenzie Valley Gas Pipeline, or any other major environmental victory. There has not been a major environmental victory won without First Nations people at the helm and a very sophisticated social movement apparatus backing them up, okay, for the last 40 years. And that's what we said when the environmentalists finally got on board and were like, oh shit, this tar sands thing's really bad. We better start doing something about it, you know. <laughs> And we told them this eight years ago. We said, you know what? If you throw all your money behind 
First Nations legal challenges and organizing strategies, base building strategies that expand a political base of resistance to hold not only First Nations leaders accountable under precarious situations and hard decisions, but also leadership in other municipalities in Canada to move us forward in a real movement for climate and energy justice. We can't make this movement about numbers, is what we said. If we start framing everything around parts per million concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, that's not going to get people into the streets, okay? It's not going to get people into the streets. And sure enough, over the last eight years, we've seen in the U.S. side the collapse of the America Energy and Securities Climate Bill, the waxman marquee Bill. Tens of millions of dollars went into the Beltway to make that climate bill happen, and it failed. And the American climate movement was turned on its head, and they were like, what do we do now? You know? And in Canada now, we we're having a similar situation. In a post-Bill C-45 era, where all of the, the, the environmental oversight, approval, and enforcement mechanisms to protect our water, to determine whether or not mega energy infrastructure projects are in the national interest. All of those participatory democratic mechanisms have either been stripped or significantly manipulated. And all roads now lead to the PMO, the Prime Minister's office. And so things have gotten bad. And now everything falls on the shoulders of indigenous peoples. Because, you know, this country, this, well, sorry, not this country, but this government, okay, our federal government and the government of this province will stop at nothing to get tar sands to be unlandlocked, okay? And that's why we're stuck in this never-ending shell game against pipelines, why we have a half a dozen mega-continental pipelines on the table. It's a shell game. They don't care which one gets built. They don't care if it's Enbridge Gateway, Kinder Morgan Expansion, Energy East, or as we like to call it, Energy Beast, you know, Keystone XL. And now there's two more pipelines they're proposing in the Great Lakes to connect with Keystone XL South, which is already built. They don't care, okay? They just want to get this oil to market, to international market. It's not about... American energy security or Canadian energy security, it's about getting it to market. That's all big oil cares about. And they will propose pipeline after pipeline after pipeline if we don't start focusing on stopping it at the source. Our children will be campaigning against pipelines. Okay? <clears throat> and I think that, you know, for us, for years, what we, what we did in the Tar Sands campaign is we started real humble. We started in Fort Chippewan. We sponsored uh, a gathering of people from Fort Chip who were, who were really scared. You know, they're scared to eat their food, scared to drink their water, scared to swim in the water, you know. And I'm sure you've all heard the statistics, but this is a small, sleepy village of 1,200 people, you know, 200 and 40 clicks downstream from the tar sands from Fort Mac Boomtown. And they've had 100 people die from cancer, from autoimmune deficiencies in, in, in just 10 years. Okay? And, and six of those cancer related deaths were a rare form of bile duct cancer that has been scientifically linked with hardcore, credible scientific research to long-term exposure of mammals to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Okay? Three cases confirmed, two suspected, one unconclusive. Now, if you understand epidemiology, okay, this, this particular form of bile duct cancer occurs maybe in one per 100,000 people, okay? And so for three confirmed cases, two unconfirmed and one unconclusive, six in total, to appear in a population sample of 1,200, obviously there's an environmental, you know, P 
peace, our external environmental impact. And our elders, our native elders, they could put one and two together. They know what's up. There's no grocery store in Fort Chippewan other than the Northern, which is a genocidal corporation that has a monopoly on food distribution in native communities across the country. Costs you 12 bucks for a gallon of milk. Costs you $15 for a box of genetically modified sugar cereal. It's ridiculous, that store. And so people subsidize their diet through their hunting and fishing practices, okay? They eat moose, they eat fish, and things bioaccumulate up the food chain. And in northern Alberta and other places in the north, like where I come from, for example, we're the top of the food chain, okay? And so, <coughs> and so <coughs> what we... Uh, what we did at this humble beginning is we organized an action camp in Fort Chip. Got some people to come together. And even though they were scared, they listed out some principles of organizing, how they wanted to raise up their concerns about the tar sands and its impacts, how they wanted to assert their treaty rights, how they wanted to move forward. And we took that framework and we went to work. And the environmentalists at the time shook their heads and said, yeah, 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 no, no. You you know, you guys do what you're going to do. We, we have our own priorities. You know, we're going to talk about parts per million and we're going to target rich base, perceived bases in Canada, affluent bases, voters, you know, and we're going to talk about, you know, the Earth's atmospheric carbon cycling capacity and carbon trading and, you know, all of the financial and technological fixes that we can utilize to mitigate climate change. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I can see all nodding off already. <laughs> and we said, okay, you guys go ahead and do that. We'll meet every now and then and work, it, work things out. And fast forward to now, you know, what we were able to do was to start organizing, to start doing actions, to start organizing information sessions, to start supporting community people to speak at forums like this, to talk about their issues, to be the face of the campaign, to lead their own campaign. We started to identify funding opportunities to uh, direct community funding opportunities. So it wasn't NGOs organizing on behalf of communities, speaking on behalf of communities, but that it was the communities themselves running their own campaigns, you know, building community self-determination, building capacity, permanent infrastructure, okay? And what that resulted in was our campaign getting extremely diverse. You know, we decided that the Harper government would not listen to us. The conservative dynasty of Albertan government sure as hell wouldn't listen to us. And so we decided to take it international and to go screw with these oil companies in their backyard at their shareholder meetings in Europe. And so we targeted British Petroleum, France's Total, Norway Stat Oil, and of course, Netherlands, the Kingdom of Netherlands Shell, Royal Dutch Shell. And we went and gave it to them at the shareholder meetings. And we partnered with the European Climate Justice Movement to raise hell on the outside of those shareholder meetings. Well, community leaders were on the inside confronting the corporate CEO and boards. And this embarrassed Canada. And we directly countered a strategy by the Canadian government to meddle in the sovereignty of other nations' climate policies the Canadian government <clears throat> has spent tens of millions in trying to meddle in the climate policy in Europe, the Fuel Quality Directive, which would effectively ban tar sands fuel as part of the European transport mix. And so we've been meeting with European MPs, you know, thanking them for endorsing the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and asking them to pass this legislation because any piece of legislation that blocks the ability for Canada to market this destructive and genocidal source of energy would be good for us. And what we... And what we saw happen from all of this stuff is that, you know, 
the environmental circles, at least the people who knew better, who had a clue, who weren't, you know, trying to protect the little bit of power that they had, began to see the strategic use of coming together. And a lot of the people that have been working so hard on creating uh, a, a risk campaign around the carbon bubble, around the pricing of carbon and the very real financial risk that this posed to extreme and expensive forms of energy that have been meeting with financial managers and banks and shareholders, institutional shareholders, and saying, look, if you sink a bunch of money into the tar sands and they put a price on carbon, and you know, this is going to get really freaking expensive. And what we said to them was, you know, you should let us come to those meetings. You should let us go to those meetings. We should talk to them because I think that what we were, what we figured out through that whole process was that, well, well, the carbon bubble strategy, you know, is a kind of pie in the eye strategy and a, and a very good one, okay? And it definitely has a good foothold in a legal basis in places like the European Union. The political will and the legal basis does not exist in the United States or in Canada at this point. It might, it might someday, you know. Hopefully President Obama stops sending drones to the Middle East and killing children and starts addressing the climate crisis. You know, hopefully, I, I doubt it, but hopefully. And hopefully, you know, we dethrone Harper in 2015 and get a sane government into this country. <laughs> and we pass some kind of climate legislation and create an energy strategy for this country and, you know, drive up the price of oil create this carbon bubble risk thing, you know. But in the meantime, it doesn't exist, okay? And what we have for the, at least the next four to five years is we have in a post-Bill C-45 era where the Navigable Waters Act has been stripped of all of its things, where pipelines can get approved without environmental impact assessments, we have hundreds, 636 indigenous communities, First Nations communities with constitutionally enshrined priority rights that supersede provincial jurisdiction over natural resources and extractions. Provinces, through the Natural Resources Transfer Act, have jurisdiction, but by the laws of Canada, must consult with First Nations on any kind of development that impacts traditional treaty territory. And provinces act illegal quite a, few, quite a bit, you know. They, they break their own laws. Canada breaks its own laws. It violates indigenous rights left and right. It interprets them at their, own, at their own peace. I'm not here to tell you that this is the silver bullet. The native rights-based strategic framework will work if we resource it accordingly and if we build a profound social movement that unites labor, that unites indigenous peoples and other social movements like the student movement like the environmental and conservation movement and create an actual movement in this country that is talking about the real issue, which is not climate change, is not tar sands, it's our economic model. A model that is predatory, that is designed, and that is telling us that it's okay to sacrifice certain communities at the altar of irresponsible resource development and economic policy so that shareholders and CEOs thousands of kilometers away can line their pockets, okay? That's the problem. And we've, you know, we've got we've to get over being afraid to say the big C. What's the big C? Capitalism. Exactly. <laughs> we've got to start talking about that. And you don't have to call it capitalism if people in your circles are like, oh, you communist, you know? <laughs> Use free market neoliberal economics. Because <laughs> then you don't sound like a Marxist, you sound like you read, you know? <laughs> oh, it's free market neoliberalism, that's the problem. Yes, absolutely, I digress. <laughs> you know? <it's... clears throat> So enter idle no more, okay? Enter idle no more. How, how many of y'all heard the story about idle no more? How did idle no more start? Yeah. You. Okay. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> don't, don't be shy. Sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, anybody else? OK. OK, that's perfect. How many of y'all heard the story about Rosa Parks? Yeah? What, what's the story about Rosa Parks? What, what's the story? OK, good. OK, well, don't give it away now. Come on. OK, the story about Rosa Parks, okay, the meme about Rosa Parks is that she's this like, humble black lady in America at a time of apartheid, racial apartheid. And she's shopping, and she's like, oh, man, these groceries are heavy. And she got on the bus, and she's like, you know what? This has just been a shit day, and I'm going to sit at the front of the bus because my back's sore. Ah. And then, boom, the civil rights movement started. <laughs> and, you know, and, 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 and the four founders of Idle No More, Jess Worth, Sheila McLean, Sylvia McAdams, and uh, uh, Nina, Nina Weste, three First Nations women and one settler backgrounded women, you know, they get a lot of that Rosa Parks kind of Superman, Jesus Christ superstar <laughs> shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> and well, that, that, that kind of like American like heroism, like superhero story narrative is, is cool. Um, the real story is so much more empowering. Because the real story is that these four women, they hooked up and they were like, concerned, everybody was talking about Bill C-45 and this mega crime bill, Bill C-38, that was going to put all of our young Native people in jail, like there aren't enough of our young Native people in jail already. And they decided to start doing workshops, you know, in the community, face to face with people, to start educating people about why we needed to stop this legislation. And they decided to start a hashtag, you know, on Twitter. They started, I don't, I don't even know which one put it up there. It's in the Idle No More chronology on our website, idlenomore.com. But basically, for whatever reason, that phrase, Idle No More, it's pretty controversial, actually, in our native circles. Because hardcore, like, American Indian movement, like, hardcore, like, radical, whatever, people are like, I've never been idle, you know? <laughs> I've been organizing since I came out of mom, you know? And... <laughs> but Idle No More was never about the people that are already hardcore rocking and rolling in the movement. For whatever reason, Idle No More struck right into the heart of the indifference and the apathy that has been so prevalent in the Native community in our country after so many years of being dispossessed from our homelands and our way of life and, you know, a hundred years of genocidal policies like residential schools, having our kids taken away, taking away the ability of our men to hunt and provide, you know, taking away the ability of our grandparents to pass down their teachings. For some reason, that phrase, I don't know more, touched people and it brought tens of thousands of our native people into the streets last winter. At the height of Idle No More, we had over 200 actions across the country, tens of thousands of First Nations and our allies marching through the streets of these cities, of these reservations, of these small municipalities. And it was freaking awesome. Now, yeah. Now Idle No More boasts a database almost 300,000 supporters. And these are all people that have attended I Don't Know More events, signed up to join the movement through our website, taken some online action, or done action out on the street or out on the lands. Um, we've got 20,000 followers on Twitter. And our official Facebook groups combined have half a million followers. And so there's something really profound there. And while the corporate media will tell you consistently, like, like almost a week after, almost exactly a week after every time we do something big, corporate media will put out a story saying, oh, Idlemore's dead. I think they've done it like nine times now. <laughs> <laughs>
But the fact of the matter is that Idle No More is a vehicle, okay? It's a vehicle for what I'm here to be talking to you about today, this native rights strategic and tactical framework to travel, to go to our people, for us to educate our people, you know, about our power, okay? And about the responsibilities that we have, more importantly, to continue to maintain and preserve the sacredness of Mother Earth and her caring capacity to provide for our children's children's children, okay? And, you know, it's, it's really interesting how people, they, they, they idolize or they idealize, you know, this, this, this whole superhero complex because, well, the real story of these four women and how it's a continuation of this powerful um, thing that I've seen my whole life organizing, which is that our Native women are strong and they are leaders and they're defenders, you know, they're land defenders. And the Idle No More founders, they continue on that legacy. The infrastructure that allowed Idle No More to explode came from decades of organizing. It came from all those struggles that I listed to you in the beginning of this presentation, okay? It came from Indigenous Sovereignty Week, which happens in 88 cities across the world now, okay? That was organized by the network known as Defenders of the Land. That's touched tens of thousands of Canadians and people alike to educate them on the history of colonization, to get them ready for this moment right now, okay? And I think that what we have right now, and, is, and there's a bunch of shit that comes with it, like all the racism we're seeing in the media, because what I don't know more did was is it ripped the scab off of the sores on this country called Canada, the sores from the sickness of colonization and oppression. And, and, and they need to get healing, you know? And they're infected and festering. And what's coming out of them is hatred. And, you know, I guess that, you know, what I wanted to make a point about that is, is that right now, it's a time of extraordinary flux. And that's going to go back to my speaking notes. <clears throat> it is a time of extraordinary flux laden with potentialities. And these are the times when transformations and revolutions take place. But the energies must be harnessed and directed appropriately and must bring together the right mix of vision, strategy, and democratic organizing with a convergence of different movements putting forward a clear vision for radical transformation. So, let's make a commitment here and now. Let's start building grassroots community-based social movements to expose and confront political corruption of corporate power that is undercutting, that is eroding, and destroying the spirit of justice, sustainability, and democracy in our common lives. And I think that, you know, the dream I have for each and every one of you, for my kids, for us all, has its roots deep in reevaluating the relationship which industrialization has damaged the most. And that's the relationship that we all share with the sacredness of Mother Earth. And it involves us deepening our understanding of systems of oppression that keep us from coming together, like race, like class, and like gender power dynamics. For Idle No More to be successful, our brothers and sisters in the labor movement must work with us. Our brothers and sisters in the environmental movement must work with us, and we must trust each other because we are in a moment in time that our Native people have prophesied about, okay? The time of the seventh generation. And our prophecy, our Cree prophecy, it talks about a time when our children would be born free from the colonial mind and the shackles of colonial oppression, and where they would lead us into a better place after seven generations of darkness. And if you look at the demographics of Native people in this country right now, 75% of our people are under the age of 35, 55% under the age of 25. And that is the seventh generation. And we're seeing the manifestation of prophecy. 
And we need to root our movement in a profound anti-colonial, anti-racist, and anti-oppression framework. And we need to do it now. And I'm not saying that you all got to frickin' solve racism and sexism and all of that stuff. No, that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that we have to develop the mechanisms to mitigate these systems of oppression when they come up in our coalitions so that they don't destroy, okay? We have to come up with a way to empower this beautiful narrative of women's leadership that is directly striking at the heart of patriarchy in our economics, in our politics, in our social systems, and yes, in our spiritual systems. Because what the women leading I Don't Know More and leading the International Indigenous Tar Sands Campaign and struggles all around the planet represent is fundamentally that introduction, that reintroduction of that sacred feminine creative principle into the core of our politics, our economics, our social systems, and our spiritual systems. And I believe that that is what's going to save not Mother Earth, because Mother Earth will be here long after we're gone, but that will be what will save all of us, us members of the five-fingered nation, the human, the human people, okay? And of course, that will be what will enable us to assume what Creator put us here to do, which was to speak for those that cannot speak for themselves, our plant and animal relations in that great sacred circle of life. And so I thank you. I'd like to open up for any questions or reactions or comments, um, if we have time. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much for having me to be a part of this wonderful conference.